and welcome back to the Cincy Reform Podcast. Uh, Zach here, pastor of Ascension Reformed Church. And as you'll probably notice, my co-pilot this week is not Brandon. He has the week off, I guess. But I'd rather have with me today uh, Pastor Ryan Swale. He is a URC minister in Canada, and I'm delighted to have him on the show this week. We're going to be speaking about psalms called imprecatory psalms. Uh, and so just in just a few minutes, I'll have him define that for us. But um, before we get uh, too far into that, Ryan, would you mind just telling our audience a little bit about the United Reformed Congregation you serve, maybe a bit about the geographical region, keeping in mind that, you know, here in Cincinnati, there really aren't a lot of URC congregations, and we don't really have uh, the same sort of a culture that you probably experience up in Canada. So welcome to the show. Tell us about your congregation. Great to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Zach. Um, so I'm a pastor in Jordan Station, Ontario, which is at 25 or so minutes from Niagara Falls. Um, here in the, the Niagara Peninsula, we've got five or so um, URC churches, and um, each of them, it, good size, a few hundred people in each. Uh, there are a few larger ones, one with 700 or so. Um, and so there's a large um, Christian school in the area, a lot of other uh, sort of parachurch things. So there's some some wonderful uh, blessings in terms of the way that we are able to sort of work alongside with other churches. Um, we've got a few free Reformed churches, um, Canadian Reformed churches, PCA, OPC, HRC, a little bit of uh, everything in this area, uh, which, um, yeah, there's a lot of wonderful blessings to that ecumenically. Um, the church that I serve uh, joined uh, so it left the left the uh, CRC in 1992, and um, then uh, in, in 95, when the URC began, um, came United Reformed Church and was served from 92 to 2017 by the same pastor. Um, John Bowers was the pastor here, and then um, they were vacant for about two years. So I, um, not Canadian, I'm from from Chicago area, and my wife and I moved here. Uh, November of 2019, so almost five years ago now, and uh, have been um, pastoring here. Uh, got here about three months before COVID, so the first couple of years here were a little bit a bit different, especially here in Canada. Some of those um, restrictions lasted a lot longer, so the last two years or so has kind of been, um, uh, yeah, the first couple of years were challenging, and the last two years have been sort of kind of getting into the normal routines of regular pastoral ministry. Excellent. Well, uh, as we start to think a little bit about the uh, imprecatory Psalms, worth noting that uh, you are doing your doctorate of ministry in this uh, field. Your um, your thesis is titled The Imprecatory Pastor. And uh, we'll get into that in just a second. But um, before we kind of get into the, the particular kind of Psalms, I thought it would be worth just asking you first and foremost, why the Psalms? When Especially when we're thinking about not just the book of Psalms, but if we're thinking about singing the Psalms, why do we give within the United Reformed Churches such priority to the Psalms in our worship, in our singing? We have hymns. I'm guessing that probably the singing of the Psalms is a little bit of why you wrote on the top, you've been writing on the mm -hmm. topic of imprecatory Psalms, but maybe just taking a step back before we get into the particulars, why the Psalms? Why should we care? Why should we yeah. sing that's a great question. So uh, myself, um, I, I uh, came into the URC from a, a broadly evangelical background um, around 2015 or so. And um, as I look back over the last nine or so years, that's, I think, been one of the greatest blessings is um, learning to uh, sing the songs that Christ himself sang, that um, ultimately he himself inspired Um when Peter talks about the prophets speaking by the spirit of Christ in them, um, I think that's true of the Psalms. And in particular, when you think about the way that um, David's own experiences of, of suffering unto glory um, are typological of what happens to, to Jesus in his suffering unto glory, he explains that in Luke 24. And um, so I think there's a unique sense in which um, I think the way that Christopher Ash put it is that as we're joining and singing the songs, it's like we're we're joining the King's choir. Christ Himself is is leading us in singing. Um, you see that in Hebrews, Hebrews two and Hebrews ten, the way that it will quote the Psalms and say that uh, Christ Himself 
came into the world saying that we'll quote Psalm 40 here. Um, and so there's a, I think a, a beautiful and kind of unique aspect where um, we are um, singing about the very experiences of Christ. Um, we're singing the songs that he himself sang and that um, the church has sung for 3000 years. And um, so there's, there's an ecumenical aspect to it, but I think there's also a beautiful kind of experiential um, aspect to it. And by that, I mean, um, 30 to 40% of the Psalms are, are lament. And um, I, I think that I, I grew up in a context where those sorts of songs were, were fairly foreign. Um, maybe we would sing like, a, um, I think there was a contemporary Christian song, blessed be your name when, you know, based on, on those words in Job. But even then it was often um, in the midst of the sadness, still I'm going to, you know, praise you and, and be happy. And, but you look at the Psalms, you have Psalms like Psalm 77 or Psalm 88 that um, are, are pretty, um, yeah, uh, filled with lament and filled with things that I think a lot of people might read those at first and say, wow, I didn't realize we were allowed to express those um, questions or feelings in church. Um, Carl Truman wrote, wrote an article years ago called uh, um, what, what Do Miserable Christians Sing? And um, as a pastor ministering to people who sometimes have really rough experiences where they're they're feeling very lonely, um, it's it's good for them to know that there are songs for them to sing too. And then even evangelistically, um, I think the the decrease in psalm singing historically, uh, I mean, even in the last few generations, has had a lot to do with oh, we want to reach the world around us, so we don't want to sing those those. Uh, sad psalms or psalms about justice or whatever but um we have uh suffering people all around us in in our world and in our neighborhoods that uh are also longing to hear about um the the god who wipes away their tears and um and uh, ultimately the messiah who took even those suffering psalms of lament on his own lips and um that's what gives us hope in the midst of our sadness. So I think there's an experiential balance. There's a, there's a sort of a Christological aspect, but I think, um, and maybe this is a good transition into talking about the imprecatory Psalms is that I think there is also a theological balance that um, modern uh, Christian songs certainly lack. And, and I would say um, maybe even, even um, hymns historically uh, don't, don't probably possess this same balance um, where it's hard to read Pat, you know, through one or two Psalms in a row without having enemies present, without talking about justice, the, the holiness and righteousness of God, um, the coming judgment. And there's a Christianity Today article a few years ago where a, a, uh, someone looked at, I think it was the top 25 or, or, or more um worship songs sung in churches today and i think only one of them had even a passing mention of the justice of god and um you look at the psalms and um that is uh, far from the case so actually i think while many people might say because of the psalms that speak about judgment and justice that's why we shouldn't sing them um, that that's somehow a defect in the Psalter, I would say, no, actually, I think that's what, what, um, that's why we need them because we need to hear that there's a God of, of, of justice. Um, we need to hear that ourselves. We need to be reminded of that in the midst of, um, suffering and injustice. Certainly our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world, uh, need to hear that. And we also, um, have the privilege of, of, uh, singing those Psalms on, on their behalf, remembering those who are persecuted. And, uh, um, so I think the Psalms, um, they broaden our horizon in terms of helping us to remember that we're a small part of uh, of uh, a very uh, broad church from every tribe, you know, tongue and nation, and and uh, many of our brothers and sisters are are suffering under the cross and singing psalms of lament or even imprecatory psalms helps us to remember them. So those would be a, a few reasons why why uh, we have found my wife and I um, mm -hmm. uh, the so singing of the psalms and in, in worship to be uh, such a great uh, blessing. Absolutely. And uh, we actually became reformed at a pretty similar point in time. And some of my uh, similar experiences with the Psalms and the experiential nature have been very, yeah, um, very well said. So thanks for that.
Um, we've mentioned the word imprecatory a few times. Could you just define mm -hmm. that for us? Sure. Then talk a little bit about, you know, just the prevalence of the of imprecatory psalms within the um, within the Psalter, and even any examples you might have would be great. Yeah. Um, so imprecatory comes from the word imprecation, which um, yeah basically means um, a a prayer or or um, request for the uh, judgment of God um, on on his enemies uh, and the enemies of his people, uh, whether that be uh, an individual enemy. I mean, think throughout the, the Psalms, uh, many of them written by David, where he has individual enemies like um, Saul or others. Uh, but then also there are um, Psalms like Psalm 83 and Psalm 137 that are, are uh, more with regard to national enemies. So Israel crying out for um, the the judgment uh, for protection of God with regard to the things that she suffers because of, of her enemies. Um, so um, they're quite common. I, I, you know, I mentioned that 30 to 40% of, of the Psalter is lament Psalms. Um, imprecatory Psalms would be kind of a subcategory of that. And um, depending on, on how exactly you, you know, you, you um, parse things out, um, there's as many as 30 or 40 imprecatory psalms or, or psalms containing, you know, one or more verses with an imprecatory element. So, um, you know, that's, that's more than one in four, one in almost, you know, one in four to one, one in five, um, uh, out of the psalms. So it's, it's no small number. Um, in fact, if you just look at the first several psalms, um, it's hard to, to escape. I mean, Psalm Psalms one or, or two aren't really imprecatory, but but in Psalm one you've got the the reality of judgment against God's enemies. Psalm two, you've got this um, speaking about the Lord's anointed breaking the enemies of God with with His rod of iron, and um, and then you get into the next few. Psalm three, um, there's a prayer that uh, the Lord would strike all His enemies on the on the cheek. Um, Psalm 4 speaks about being angry and not sinning. And then Psalm 5 gives us a picture of what that looks like. As uh, David says, make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Um, Psalm 7, Psalms 9 and 10. So just in the first 10 Psalms, you've, you've got um, several of these imprecatory ones and, and themes that I think are in, informing it. Um, like I, I would say, many of the imprecatory Psalms are largely just kind of a they're praying Psalm two. They're praying, Lord, you have said that you're you're going to bring justice. So um, do what you said at, at the very beginning of, of the Psalter. Mm -hmm. And so it's probably dawning a little bit on our audience right now as to why these Psalms can be somewhat uh, controversial. I mean, there are some out there who would actually say we shouldn't sing them or they're inappropriate to the new covenant Christian. And so maybe could you flesh out a, a little bit of an explanation as to why they're controversial. We can maybe address that a little bit later and maybe answer some of those questions later. Yeah. But at least, uh, you know, making it crystal clear as to what some of the objections might be. Yeah. I, I think most of the objections come from um, looking in Luke six here, um, Matthew five would be the other version of it, where, but where Jesus uh, twice in in the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain tells us to uh, to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. And so, um, yeah, for many people, they they read that and they think, oh, that seems very different than um, some of the Psalms that I just quoted from uh, Psalm five or Psalm seven. And so, there's a couple. I mean, there's there's a lot of different explanations that are given, but I think probably the most um, influential or prevalent ones would be you have have a sort of dispensational approach that would just simply say that was a completely different Old Testament ethic for Israel, and now we're in the New Covenant, uh, and uh, we, we really don't need to sing the Psalms. We don't need to pay quite as much attention to some of those Old Testament things. Um, that was just a different, uh, different, different age. Um, you have others like C.S. Lewis and his reflections on the Psalms. Um, basically just says David was sinning. David was way off base. Those were devilish, contemptible, vulgar, and petty psalms that he wrote. And um, and so, you know, Lewis is dealing with a different understanding of, of um, inerrancy and, and some of those things as well. Um, but um, 
those are those are some of the more prevalent approaches. There are some more um, nuanced um, approaches that wouldn't be you know dispensational, but um, other ways in which they would say there was maybe something unique going on there that that we're not called to now. Um, but um, you know, I, I would say um, I don't think the call to love your enemy is unique to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, you read Leviticus 19 or Exodus right. 23 or many of the Proverbs. Um, even in the Psalms themselves, um, Psalm 35 and Psalm 109 are two of the most uh, intense imprecatory Psalms. And in both of them, David says, I have loved my enemies and I have prayed for those who persecute me and um, and they have continued doing me wrong. And, and so he, he turns to the Lord. And I think it's interesting to note that he doesn't um, say, um, let me now take up my sword and uh, and fight my enemies. He says, Lord, would you defend me? Would you do this? Um, and uh, I think the other maybe helpful thing for us to remember is um, that um, David is, um, he's praying these in his office as, as king. And so there's a, there's kind of a kingdom concern, a kingdom mm -hmm. context. This is, this is not, um, I'm angry at my neighbor for, um, you know, some sort of property line dispute, or I'm upset with the person who got the promotion that I was after. And so I'm going to pray these against them. Um, this is David concerned for the well-being of, of the kingdom of God, the people of God, the, um, the reputation of God, um, and so there are, um, I think those are just helpful things to remember in terms of um, what the, what these aren't. Well, let's, let's go into a little bit more because I think that's one of the things I appreciated about your thesis that I got to you know read before this is just the, you so helpfully situate the Psalms and those imprecations for judgment within the context of the uh, Davidic covenants that uh, royal monarchy that um, God established with David and his successors. And that's one of the things I've tried to you know, bring home to our congregation in Cincinnati is that the Davidic covenant really becomes the, I, I would say even like the central concern of the Psalms is this eventual fulfillment with the uh, king who will one day arrive and take David's throne. And so the Davidic covenant is very important um, background for this idea of what kind of psalm we're talking about but you also talk a little bit about the first gospel promise and you mentioned as well the uh, promise made to abraham in genesis 12 could you maybe under help our uh, listeners understand how those uh, particular texts um get help us to understand just how appropriate imprecations are yeah um so yeah, and you allude to that first gospel promise. That's that's Genesis three fifteen, where um, the Lord says uh, to the serpent, uh, He speaks of this enmity that there's going to be between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and and He says um, that that from uh, from Eve is going to come one that the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. And um, you know, one of the the um, books that I have found most helpful. Well, actually, there's there's a few. Um, but Trevor Lawrence uh, has written a dissertation a few years back on the imprecatory Psalms. Uh, this is not the football quarterback, Trevor Lawrence, but a different Just Trevor clarify Lawrence. clarify here. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> who, uh, one of the things that he does so well um, is he, he draws out um, all of this serpent imagery through so many of the Psalms. So just a few examples, um, Psalm 58, Psalm 83, Psalm 140, you've got these Psalms where it's describing the enemies of God as, as crafty in their deception, the same language that's used in Genesis 3 of the crafty serpent. Um, and um, they have the, the poison of asps or vipers under their lips. Um, many of these Psalms, I alluded to Psalm 3, the uh, cheek smashing, you know, head crushing imagery, uh, even some of the most intense ones, Psalm 137 about you know, being, being um, the, the children of Babylon, um, which which I think arguably Revelation 18 maybe leads us in a direction of, of seeing that as um, yeah, seed, of, seed of the serpent, children seed of the of evil one, yep, yep. Um, having their heads smashed uh, against against the rock. And so you've got um, all of this imagery in so many of these Psalms, um, head crushing, and, and there's, there's a lot of that. Um, Psalm 7 would be another example. And then even outside of the imprecatory Psalms, Psalm 68, Psalm 72, a lot of these um, 
Psalms employ some of this same language when, when speaking about the enemies of God and their eventual defeat. So I think the imprecatory Psalms, what they're doing is they're taking Genesis 3.15 and they're saying, Lord, in the very, in the very gracious promise of the gospel that you first gave was also this promise of, of judgment. Mm -hmm. And so in order for us to pray for the fulfillment of that, that, that also includes praying that, um, that evil would be, um, would be judged. And in fact, in our own catechism in Lord's day 48, um, when we pray thy kingdom come, um, it, it tells us that that's part of what we're to pray that the Lord would, um, destroy all evil and every conspiracy against his holy word. Um, so you've got these Genesis 315 uh, sort of themes running through these Psalms. Um, but Genesis 12, the, the Abrahamic covenant where um, God says, um, those who curse you, I will, will curse. And um, so I think when, when God's people are praying these Psalms and, and that includes us, uh, Galatians 3 says that we're, we're children of Abraham and so as we're um, mindful of that promise that God made to Abraham um, and considering God's people in the midst of affliction, being you know, cursed and um, harassed by, you think, especially of our persecuted brothers and sisters in other countries, um, the imprecatory Psalms are simply praying Genesis 12, 3 and saying, Lord, um, what they're doing is not right. Um, Jesus says in, you know, Acts 9, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Um, you have attached your name to these people. And so, um, so the imprecatory Psalms, I think, are, are you know, reaching back to, to Genesis 12, reaching back to Genesis 3. And then, like you said, also grounded in um, the, the Davidic covenant, where there's this sort of kingdom context throughout the whole book of the Psalms. It's um, a royal hymn book about God's um, covenant with David. and so that reminds us that these are not um, personal vendettas, but there's a there's a, a kingdom orientation, um, and and a lot of the imprecatory psalms are Davidic. There's kind of three categories. There's the national enemies, Psalm eighty three or one one thirty seven. Um, there are societal enemies, um, Psalm fifty eight or Psalm ninety four, where it kind of talks about those who are ruling, not judging justly. I think it's appropriate for us to pray when there are, you know, evil, tyrannical rulers who maybe aren't specifically targeting the church, but they're they're harming God's image bearers and doing evil things. Um, but then the 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 vast majority of them are individual imprecatory psalms, um, by my count, all of which are, are Davidic. Um, it may be one exception in Psalm 104. Um, there's only one verse that's um, that's really an imprecation. Um, but um, I think that reminds us, again, that that this is not about those who are just simply opposing uh, me, but those who are opposing the, the king, David's son, and, um, and, and God's kingdom. So I have found those, those categories to be really helpful in, in understanding kind of what, what's actually going on in these. These are not just these uh, sort of um, rogue, out of nowhere like like Lewis would say, uh, petty, vulgar cries of of David the sinner, uh, but this is David the saint uh, praying the the promises of God. Yeah, very helpful. And you know, just for our listeners' sake, we're going to come up to some uh, you know guidance from uh, Ryan here in just a minute about uh, how we should interpret these psalms and guidelines from him on that. But uh, before we get there, I want to make sure that our listener understands that. The idea of imprecations under the new covenant of the new testament th that they're very much appropriate and so let's just let uh, ryan explain some places in the new testament where we see evidence of that because uh, thus far we haven't really looked too far into the new testament we've mentioned a couple places already but uh, maybe you can just sketch that out for us as well like what's the new yeah. testament witness that helps us to think to, to to recognize that these are yes appropriate to sing to pray and to guide our Christian piety. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just maybe for a, a quick survey, you, you can you can just take a few Psalms, like Psalm 69, for instance. Um, Psalm 69 is one of the most commonly quoted uh, Psalms, uh, in particular with regard to the Messiah and, and his suffering. But it's interesting, uh, Psalm 69, um, I think it's verses 22 through 28, there's a rather large imprecatory section um, where... 
David in his suffering that is anticipating the suffering of Christ is um, is is praying for God's judgment on um, those who have betrayed and and um, abused him and um, that's quoted several times in the New Testament even the the imprecatory section um, so like in Acts chapter one um, you have um, Peter quoting from Psalm sixty nine and Psalm one hundred and nine which is arguably the the um, harshest of the imprecatory psalms and um, and, and applying both of those to um, to Judas and and I think what he's doing is he's showing Judas in his or or those who opposed David um, are sort of the uh, they are that's typological of those who are opposing the son of David which Judas is the the prime example um, and yet I think it's also important to remember that um, that we're not limited just in only you know, applying those to the actual historical enemies of Jesus um, in his betrayal, because um, later on in the New Testament, Paul in Romans 11 will quote one of those same imprecatory sections um, uh, with regard to those who have rejected the Messiah and are persecuting his people. Um, even in the book of Acts, um, Acts chapter 4, um, as the, the church is, is suffering under the cross, um, the, the believers are gathered together in, in this prayer meeting. What are they praying? But, but Psalm 2 about how the, the Gentiles and the nations are raging and plotting in vain. And then they say, I think it's in verse um, 29, um, look upon their threats, O Lord. They're, they're praying for justice in the midst of the things they're suffering. Um, so I think you could look at some of the other places in Acts where there are, are um, for example, Acts 12, you've got um, uh, James has just been killed. Peter has been unjustly imprisoned. And it shows the church, again, at, at a prayer meeting. Um, and um, and the narrative concludes with, with Herod's demise, um, which I think arguably, arguably could be interpreted um, as, as Luke framing that as, as the answer to the, the prayers of of the, the church or act 16 um this midnight psalm saying with uh you know paul having been unjustly imprisoned and there's then an earthquake reminiscent of what we saw in acts 4 and um and uh i, I don't think it's it's um too far-fetched to to think that amongst the psalms that they might have been singing would have been um, psalms that that are, are praying for justice in the midst of the things that they suffer. But but I think when we go to the Gospels, actually, we see some of the, the clearest evidence. Um, Jesus in Matthew 23, for example, the woes that he is pronouncing upon the Pharisees, those are, those are covenant curses. Um, Jesus even cursing the fig tree um, that is um, sort of symbolic of, of Israel and the, the temple system and the, the coming demise. Um, Jesus in Luke 18, this is maybe the, the clearest example where he gives an example. Um, he, it says he wants to teach his disciples so that they will not grow weary in, in how to pray. And what is the example that he gives? But um, a widow who has been unjustly treated and, and goes day after day to her her the judge and says, give me justice against my adversary. And uh, Jesus holds her up as an example of how to pray. And, um, and then says, when the son of man comes, will he not find faith on earth? I think um, saying that that kind of prayer is an example of the kind of faith for which he's looking, which I think is supported by say the fourth beatitude where we're called to, to hunger and thirst for mm. um, righteousness or justice. Um, the second petition called to pray for the coming of his kingdom, which implies the destruction of um, all that is opposed to, to the Christ's kingdom. Um, you see examples in the book of Acts um, um, of, of imprecations in, in um, Acts 8, Acts 13, um, Paul in 2 Timothy 4 with uh, Alexander the coppersmith, or uh, the saints in Revelation 6, um, how long, O oh Lord, until you will avenge our blood on the earth? And actually, they're quoting from Psalm 79 there. Um, and, and so I think um, that just that brief little survey of the New Testament shows that, um, as, um, as one author put it, the New Testament stance toward imprecation is not one of abrogation, but rather one of affirmation, that um, the apostles and Christ himself understood themselves to be heirs of the Old Testament ethics. They're not um, 
you know, the, the New Testament gives us a lot of commands to sing the Psalms, Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5. And um, nowhere is, is there sort of a, a footnote or qualification that says, except for those 30 or 40 that contain an imprecatory element, take your scissors to those ones. Um, so I think um, when you look at the New Testament evidence, you would be hard pressed to come to the conclusion that um, that we are, are not to sing those. The apostles, Christ himself, and the saints in heaven are um, are uh, singing and praying them. Yeah, excellent. Well, you know, you're already, I think, getting to this, uh, helping us to see some of the guidelines that you're establishing already, but I want you to draw those out for us a little bit, because I think, you know, living here in the States, I know you're from the States, you know that there's going to be a very uh, contentious uh, election season coming up here soon. So I could imagine people hearing this and like, oh, yeah, I'm going to pray these uh, imprecations against my geopolitical um, enemies. Yeah. That's how we should use these. Or, you know, you mentioned I can't do that with respect to somebody who got a, a job promotion over me, but maybe this other person I can <laughs> hurl imprecations at them. So, uh, you know, can you give us some guidance here? Because clearly if we're asking uh, the Lord to um, to to judge we need to be careful with that and we need to conduct ourselves um, where we're, you know, have, with a righteous anger and with a, in a way that is not uh, taking vengeance into our hands, but allowing the Lord to repay. So could you yeah, give us some guidelines here in terms of how we interpret, how we apply, utilize these imperfect yeah. systems? You know, I think one of the most helpful passages to turn to for guidance on this is, is Psalm 139. Um, where David says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God, O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? And, and immediately after that, David says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if they're to any grievous way within me and lead me in the way everlasting. Um, I think what David is teaching us is that the proper posture with which we pray these is is um, a um, is is one of heart searching and asking the Lord to search our hearts and and to say, um, if Lord, am I praying this vindictively? Am I praying this in a way where um, where um, I am 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 taking sinful pleasure in in the judgment for which i'm praying because that was not the case with david and like i said in, in psalm 35 or psalm 109 you see actually um that it's possible um even it is as it is with with the lord who um, is said in the psalms to to um, hate the wicked and yet also in say the sermon on the mount um, he calls us to love our enemies as as god himself does making the rain to fall on the just and the unjust and so david himself i think we, we see that sort of dynamic where where you see him Doing both, and so uh, I have, I've come up with I, I think six or so maybe questions or um, sort of guardrails to to ask yourself. So one, am I praying this vindictively? I think Psalm one thirty nine is, is a help there. Another helpful question to ask is simply, um, am I actually in the right in this situation? Um, Psalm seven and Psalm seventeen. David at the beginning of his prayer he says, Lord, if I have done this, what what they're accusing me of. If there is any wrong in my hand, if I've if I've repaid my friend with with evil or or done what they're accusing me of, then then Lord, you judge me. Um, and actually, Paul does the same thing in Galatians one. Where he pronounces a curse on anyone, even himself, who preaches another gospel. Um, so, asking ourselves, am I praying this vindictively? Um, am I really in in the right here? Because um, if we are hastily rushing into praying for the the justice of God in a certain situation where we're actually in the wrong. Um, it's something that we might want to, to um, you know, be, be careful about. Um, third, I think it's helpful to ask the question, am I praying this with regard to my own enemies or to Christ's? Um, even as you might use these liturgically or, or um, in, in terms of the ways that Psalms like this might um, inform congregational prayer or something like that, I think it's helpful to ask yourself, is this something that the people of God can and should add their amen to, or is this something that is simply I I um 
I'm, you know, angry about this situation or, or, or maybe even as a preacher, I'm, I'm dragging my political rivalries or um, social media kerfuffles into the pulpit and, um, and uh, taking the Lord's name in vain, perhaps by uh, applying these Psalms to those situations. Um, fourth, am I, uh, am I praying this with a heart of, of love that's, that's open to the possibility of God answering this prayer through the conversion of these enemies? Mm-hmm. Some of the Psalms, like Psalm 83, um, Psalm, Psalm 2 and Psalm 7, a few others do the same thing, but, but Psalm 83 prays ex- explicitly that the judgment for which Asaph is asking would lead to the conversion um, of, of those enemies that he has in mind. And so um, if, uh, if I am unwilling to have the Lord answer, um, you know, I think it was Abraham Lincoln said something like, um, my when my enemies become my friends, is it not true that they have been destroyed? Or does the Lord not destroy those those enemies of mine to become my friends or something like that? And I think there's a sense in which, yeah, um, the Lord might answer a, a prayer for the removal of his enemies by, uh, think of someone like Saul, uh, turning them into uh, 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 apostles of the Gentiles and converting them. And so if I'm not open to the Lord answering it in that way, um, I think that suggests that that something is 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 not right in 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 my own heart. Um, another helpful guideline, I think, um, am I praying this as uh, one who recognizes that I was once God's enemy? Um, you know, it's interesting. Another um, catechism question that I think uh, is relevant here is, you know, when it asks. How does it comfort you that Christ will come again to judge living in the dead? And it, it talks about how we, with uplifted head, wait for, for Christ to come again, um, to, to judge all his enemies in mind and cast them into everlasting condemnation. But but there's this little sort of um, clause in there where it says, for Christ to come as the judge, who has already stood in the judgment in my place. And so it's this reminder that even as we pray for justice and, and judgment, that um, that were it not for the grace of God, that is precisely what we deserve. Now, I don't think that means um, that that we're not allowed to pray them, but I think it changes the posture with which we pray them to one of of humility, um, one of we're not better than these people, but our our concern is for um, the relief of the afflicted, the glory of God, the justice of God, um, and then maybe one last um, helpful guideline is. Um, are these the only things that I'm praying? You know, uh, First Timothy two uh, verses one and two um, give us. Uh, you know, talks about supplications and prayers and intercessions for for all men, uh, praying for those in in authority. And so, um, if all I'm praying is imprecation and I'm not praying in any of those other categories, then um, then I think that suggests an imbalance, right? And so I think um, even in terms of application, if I was you know talking to uh, a a preacher or uh, somebody who's thinking, how can we utilize these some within our own liturgy? Um, my suggestion would be uh, utilize them w- within the movement and balance of the whole Psalter. Um, when I joined the URC, our, our um, church in Illinois had the, the practice of in their evening worship each Lord's Day, prior to the congregational prayer, we would have a Lectio continuous Psalm reading. So we would you know, read this week, maybe it's Psalm 110 and then sing through it. And then that Psalm would sort of shape and inform our congregational prayer. Um, I think it, if, if you were to have a practice, something like that, um, and this is not just true liturgically, but even just devotionally as an individual, I think that that's going to help keep you from the imbalance that might say, I only want to pray these Psalms and, um, and no other kind. So I think um, in terms of implementation, reading them, praying them, singing them within the context of the whole Psalter. I also think that's going to make it a little bit more palatable for, um, for a congregation. Um, Mm -hmm. If I just, if a church is not singing the Psalms at all, and then we just kind of come out of nowhere with Psalm 109 or Psalm 137, that's going to be fairly jarring. But if they have already been introduced to some of the themes of Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, these other Psalms, it's, there's going to be a context for it that will, that will make sense. Um, so um, I don't know if you have any other questions about sort of general guidelines, do's and don'ts. Um, those are just a few thoughts. No, I, th- I think those are very helpful. Just practically speaking, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on this, but uh, 
Are there any settings in the Trinity Psalter hymnal, you know, for those of our listeners who might have a copy of that, that you think are especially helpful settings that maybe they could turn to after this podcast episode finishes and to even sing one that is, um, you know, especially um, a good setting? Yeah. Anything you might recommend? Yeah. Um, I think Psalm 83 um, is, is a very good one. And Psalm 83 is an interesting one where it's speaking about this sort of coalition of enemies from all these different nations 10 of them are named i think representing kind of the fullness of the enemies of god's people coming against the church and trying to wipe them out as as a people and uh i think i think the title is oh my god do not keep silent and it's a cry for um for for christ to um to uh, bring relief to his afflicted people and i think um yeah, as I think, I mean, I think that's one example of one that I think is well paired with a with a, a good tune. Um, there's others as well. I think Psalm 35. I preached that a couple of months ago, and and that was a um, um, yeah. We sang that after, and I think it went went well. Um, mm-hmm. There's a few that are um, as as I've done the same sort of lectio continua psalm reading and singing. Uh, maybe in the 50s or 60s, there were a few that were, uh, yeah, not a little more difficult but um Mm -hmm. but uh yeah psalm 83 is at least one example thanks thanks um so uh in terms of you know the question in terms of identifying the kind of enemies of god uh when we think about who's an appropriate um you know object of an imprecation um i assume it's it's obviously you know uh, clear that we can pray these against satan right he's the Mm -hmm. great enemy of god you already mentioned that um, probably prayed against even our own sin in some ways. I don't know if you'd agree with that. Um, the world corporately as a corporate entity that's, you know, against the church, mm-hmm. the, the seat of the serpents, right. As a corporate consideration. Yeah. Um, and then I think it probably comes down to like, when is it appropriate to pray for individuals? Um, until this point in time, I probably viewed it from the vantage point of, if and when somebody arises to like a, a a figure that's like an antichrist sort of figure, I feel like I'm very comfortable at that point to, to pray an imprecation. Yeah. Um, but I guess I'm thinking through like when when does one become an an enemy of God and His people and His kingdom? Is it uh, really confined to like an antichrist sort of figure, or are there uh, other kind of places where you could identify someone to be such an enemy of God? That they can be, um, you know, a rightful, um, yeah, recipient of the imprecation. I, I think it's an excellent question. I'm just sort of pulling up here, um, Lord's Day 52, mm-hmm. you know, where it, it speaks about the sixth petition, um, and uh, we're so weak that we cannot stand on our own even for a moment, and our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, never stop attacking us. And so, um, and, and then it's a, it's a, the rest of that prayer is is sort of a warfare context so lord uphold us make us strong so that we might may not be defeated in this spiritual fight but may firmly resist our enemies till we finally win the complete victory so i I think you're right um you basically named those three categories the devil the world and our own flesh um now i I think there are some and lewis would be one example um who who would kind of he, he sort of said the only uh, redeemable use of these imprecatory psalms is that maybe we can just direct them at our own sin. Um, mm. And um, I, I would say he's wrong that that's the only use, but he's right that that is a use. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think um, if the devil, the world, and our own flesh are um, are uh, in these categories of, of, of enemies and of, of even being serpent-like at times, um, mm-hmm. our own sin, that, uh, that it's right for us to, to pray that. And I, I actually think uh, liturgically and in the context of um, of corporate worship and even corporate confession of sin, it's helpful for us to be reminded of that. That as we're praying um, for the Lord to judge, um, you know, liars and abusers and tyrants and, and this, and um, insofar as that's true of us, Lord, would you um, would you cleanse us and and uh, judge us? One writer has said that it's almost as if these psalms when sung corporately have a sort of church disciplinary kind of function where they're crying out to the king of the church to uproot liars and tyrants from amongst us um maybe that's especially helpful as you think of some of the scandals in the last several years in terms of widespread 
sexual abuse cover-ups denomination wide and, and these kinds of things uh, clergy even you know taking part in these things and um so i i would um yeah, I think certainly it can have a sort of inward directed application, certainly against um, Satan. Um, but I think also to your your last question, the, the world, um, insofar as um, it is in opposition to the Lord Christ, or you know, I think you look at some of these Psalm 58 against societal enemies, um, those who are trampling the weak and... and um, I think that there's a, a an appropriate application as we think of you know evil dictators in other countries, um, not just persecuting the Lord's people, but also His image bearers, and um, and ultimately then what what each of those are rooted in is uh, there's there's a, a, a an objective sort of God word orientation. It's because God's children, God's image bearers, are being abused that that we may. Uh, that we may pray these. Um, I, I think, you know, maybe the way that I, I might um, utilize these um, personally versus the way that that I might use them liturgically, uh, corporately, I think it might be a helpful rule to be a little bit more general in uh, public prayer than, you know, you again, wanting wanting God's people to be able to add their, their amen to it. Um, and also not wanting to... Um, yeah, I think that I think that um, you you mentioned sort of a, an election season and, and some of these sorts of things. There have been ways that these have been um, misused. One, I think it was one state representative uh, a year or two ago made waves for saying, "I pray Psalm 109:8 uh, about Biden," and um, I don't think that's um, yeah, I, I, that's that's not what I'm arguing for here. Um, but um, I think I think there are certain misuses where we're yeah, directing them purely against someone because we have, we have demonized political opponents, mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, okay. So I hope that's somewhat helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of wrapping up here. I mean, what do you, what do you think again, to just encourage our listeners to take this seriously? What might be some repercussions of not giving time to the imprecatory Psalms, singing them, praying them, um, conceiving of the desirability of God's final judgments. I mean, what were your thoughts? Yeah, I would say two things. Um, I think there are implications societally of a neglect of the Psalms. And then I think there are also implications um, individually. And so when, when I say um, societally, I mentioned that we, we, we live in an age where a lot of um, denominations have literally removed the impregnatory Psalms from their hymn books. Um, sort of sheepishly embarrassed mm. we're trying to reach the world and we we're kind of embarrassed that the bible talks about judgment and justice and people might sort of think that's that's weird and i actually think that's that's what the world around us uh needs to hear and though they don't realize it they want to hear um in in the reason for god uh tim keller i think he quotes uh miroslav volf and says something along the lines of it it, it is the lack of belief in a God of vengeance that secretly nourishes vengeance uh, or violence. Um, I think what he's getting at is um, we, we live in a culture that has said, we don't want a God of justice. And so something like summer 2020 with George Floyd happens and people are in the streets rioting, burning down buildings, trying to bring about justice themselves. Um, and so instead of hiding these psalms away, um, I, I think um, they actually have an apologetic use in terms of the church, uh, church's preaching, prayer, and, and singing ministry um, to communicate to the world around us um, uh, God's outrage at, at evils and injustices like that. Um, and uh, so I, I think one of the repercussions is failing to testify to the world around us of the God of justice, even when there are things... I mentioned some of these abuse scandals and things that the mm -hmm. church is complicit in to be able to say that's that's not that's not who God is. God is is um, is outraged over these things, too, as are we as, as the church. Um, so I think um, there's that sort of uh, wider scale um, repercussions. But then individually, one of the things that I, I have I'm very interested in is 
possible uses of of the Psalms in terms of personal pastoral care, even pastoral counseling. Um, certainly the Psalms of Lament can be used in that way. Um, but there's a few helpful resources out there on um, even walking through the Psalms of Justice with um, victims of abuse mm -hmm. and uh, domestic violence, sexual abuse, um, and these things where um, I think sometimes we can um, have a little bit of a um, shallow, um, quick approach to forgiveness, um, forgive and forget just, you know, right away, don't talk about it. And um, I think sometimes what happens then is these deep feelings of anger and unforgiveness lie just beneath the surface. And what these Psalms allow us to do in, in a slower, but, but more, um, thorough and healthy way, I think, is to give voice to um, the, the feelings of, of anguish because of things that that you've experienced, and then to be able to hand it over to God. And I actually think they take us on a a, a longer, slower, but, but better route towards forgiveness uh, eventually. And so I think mm -hmm. um, there are um, some really um, wonderful potential benefits in terms of um, pastoral counseling apologetics, um, certainly liturgical use of these things. So that's that's kind of been my aim and interest. A, a demon project is a lot more practical than like a, a dissertation or something like that. And so my my aim is kind of trying to see in terms of pastoral theology, what are what are the ways that these psalms can um can help us as as pastors as we minister to God's people. So well, that's excellent. Well um I guess maybe we'll kind of leave that as a little bit of a uh a teaser if i can get you on for another episode in the future perhaps we can talk about uh the use of the imprecatory psalms in terms of uh forgiveness uh and in terms of uh, working through um some of the deep wounds that people might have i, I think that'd be a very productive conversation but i'll, I'll twist your arm later and see if i can get you back on <laughs> that sounds good uh, yeah thanks so much for your time ryan and uh this has been the sensor reform podcast i hope that uh, this is i'm sure this has been a helpful conversation for you to uh, listen in on. If uh, you have any reaction to this, uh, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. And um, we'll be uh, airing a, an episode in uh, next week, I believe. Uh, that's going to be a bit of a wrap up on the URC Synod meeting and kind of uh, reporting back as to what happened in um, Escondido in uh, 2024 for the uh, Synod meeting. But um, this should be, uh, this will be aired uh, at the beginning of that week. Um, so it should be about uh, June 17th. So if you're, if you're listening to this and you're, uh, um, think of it, please uh, pray for our synodical deliberations. We'd appreciate that very much. Uh, Ryan will be there, I believe, right? You'll be there. Yes. Right. Yeah. I'll be there. Um, and, uh, we'll, we could use the prayers of the saints. So, uh, but, uh, until uh, next week, this has been the Sensor reform podcast. Uh, thanks again, Ryan, for joining us and, uh, we'll be signing off now. Thanks. Bye-bye. Exactly.